topic today, as it has been introduced, it's uh, antibiotic use in uh, interventional radiology. Okay. Forward. So we'll be using this uh, article as our point just for discussion today. So basically, uh, antibiotic use in interventional radiology is a broad subject. And I just decided to take this uh, paper that was published in the Elsevier from the Royal College of Radiologists. Uh, and we'll be using this as uh, our, I took summaries from this uh, paper. So evidence of you on the use of antibiotic prophylaxis is uh, in IR still remains limited because there's still ongoing studies on what antibiotic can be used and how long it can be given as a prophylaxis. So, but the limitations mostly arose with the advancement of the clinical technology and the emergence of the antibiotic resistant organisms. And um, so in spite of the best practice with respect to sterile technique, reduction of infection requires consideration of the prophylactic and the periprocedure antibiotic administration. So these recommendations for, from this paper that is, they're based on the comprehensive literature that was done, which includes prospective retrospective studies and as well as evidence from expert committees. So when do you give uh, antibiotic prophylaxis and how long should you give it for in, the, in terms of the periprocedure? So previously, in the previous years, like in 1960s, early 60s and uh, late 50s, it was thought that if you give uh, prophylaxis uh, less than three hours prior to the procedure, this should be enough to cover, to give a maximum coverage for, for infection. But currently now, the timing really depends on whether the antibiotic you're giving is a short acting one or a long acting one. And the timings that you give will really depend on the type that you give it. So if you're considering like giving a short acting antibiotic, then the timing should be between 30 to 60 minutes prior to the procedure. And if you're giving a long acting antibiotic, this will be 60 to 120 minutes prior to the procedure. So these timings should be enough to cover you for the procedure that you want to do. So this will really depend also on the half-life. So you need to know the half-life of the medications that you give in order for you to know when, when to give it prior to the procedure. So, but some authors have recommended that if in case a procedure lasts more than two hours, then someone should consider giving an extra or additional antibiotic prophylaxis. The same medication, but give it extra because you're taking a lot of time in the procedure. So resistance, again, is another uh, factor. So the, there has been a multidrug resistant bacteria and the prevalence has increased in recent years, which this has been contributed by multiple factors. And as a result, this affects the ability to fight infections. So most people now use over-the-counter uh, medications, antibiotic prescribed medication. So these increase to the resistance in the bacteria. So careful selection of antibiotics for prophylaxis should be done. And this has generally to be directed at the organisms likely to be encountered in the procedure. So we're going to see uh, some of the vascular and some of the non-vascular procedures that are commonly performed. And with these, we'll see the common organisms that are basically found in those procedures or according to those procedures. And we'll also see some of the medications that are recommended by most authors to be used in those procedures. So when we start, we can start with the percutaneous gastrostomy, which this has been an alternative to endoscopic or surgical placed uh, gastrostomies. So infective complications due to these procedures are rare and the incidence is reported at 2% with most being related to skin flora. So common organisms are those that you find in the skin, like uh, staph, Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermis, and the Corinobacterium species. So the prophylaxis that is recommended for these is especially in those patients that have high risk, which these include those patients with the head and neck tumors. So for these, you can give either one gram of cefazolin IV before you start the procedure, and then can be followed up by 500 milligrams of cephalexin, which you give it twice a day for five days post-procedure. So these can either be given orally if a patient can swallow, 
or since you've placed a tube already, you can give it via the tube. Or uh, an alternative will be giving a clindamycin 600 milligrams at the time of the procedure and followed by 600 milligrams twice daily for five days post-procedure. So another procedure here is the percutaneous nephrostomy, which for these most bacteremia post-procedure are related to mechanical agitation of the infected and over distended system and also the passage of needle through the kidney. So for those patients that come in with the clinical evidence of infection, such that they have fever or leukocytosis, so these should be treated empirically. That means they should come in already on antibiotics until that specific organism is known. So when you're doing an aphrostomy, then you take a, a urine sample, you culture it after you find out what organism, you can counter check with what medication the patient has been on. If it's not the same medication, then you change accordingly. So the prophylaxis again should be considered in those patients that don't have infection, but are a high risk category, including those patients with uh, advanced age, patients with diabetes, bladder dysfunction, indwelling catheters, patients with calculi or bacteriuria. So most common risk uh, for infection in these procedures is again related to whether a patient had prior intervention plus the obstruction that's already there. Either it be from malignancy or a stone. Okay, so most common organisms found in these procedures include the E. coli, the Klebsiella species, Proteus, Enterococcus, and other enterobacteria. So for these now, the common prophylactic regime includes the one gram ceftriaxone, or you can give IV 1.5 to three grams ampicillin salbactam combination, or you can give ampicillin with 120 milligrams of gentamicin. So, but some studies have shown that if you give a single oral dose of 500 milligram Cipro, 60 minutes prior to the procedure, this should cover and it's as effective as giving IV cefazole prior to the procedure. So the choice is uh, dependent on the hospital and the clinician that's performing the procedure. So in 2012, in the biliary now interventions, in 2012, the UK biliary drainage and stenting registry recorded around 7.7% of post-procedure minor sepsis and 35 of the major sepsis post-procedure, which this was comparable to what SIR analysis showed, which showed around 2.5% of the sepsis post-procedure. So again, for the biliary interventions, the risk factors for bacterial colonization includes advanced age, diabetes, fever, acute cholecystitis, and if a patient had previous biliary surgery, like including sphincterotomy, sphincterotomy, sorry. And uh, <clears throat> for sepsis now, the risk factors would include if a patient had previous biliary instrumentation, or bilioenteric anastomosis. So all these patients are at a risk of developing sepsis or bacteremia. And as such, they either should be already on antibiotic or you should consider giving them a prophylaxis prior to the procedure. So the cultured organisms, as we can see here, include almost similar to what we've seen previously. And in addition to that, maybe the Clostridium and E. coli. So most people advocate for the use of antibiotics, as I said, which these would include the third generation cephalosporins plus or minus the beta lactam antibiotics, such as mes mesocillin or ampicillin plus uh, sublactam combination. So again, another regime would include uh, one gram IV ceftriaxone or cefotenan uh, with four grams of mesocillin and also you can give a combination or you can give gentamicin. So you should also consider in those patients with penicillin allergy, where you can use uh, vancomycin or clindamycin instead of those penicillins. So we move in into hepatic thermotumor ablation. So complication uh, post-procedure for these are low which is less than 1.5% recorded. So the risk factors, again, most feared complication with this includes the liver abscess. So, but then the risk factors for developing this would include those patients with diabetic, 
uh, bilioenteric anastomosis, sphincterotomies, or CBD stentings. So the prophylaxis recommended for this includes the one gram cefazolin IV or ceftriaxone and 1.5 grams of the combination of ampicillin and salvata. So we move into abscess drainage now. So most patients in this group already come in on antibiotics, as we can see, that are already given either from the ward or as an outpatient basis. So the standard of practice committee for the SIR proposed that antibiotics should only be reserved for those patients with clinical symptoms and signs of infection, such as patients that come in with fever and leukocytosis. So for also consider that patients that are already on empirical antibiotics, the timings that those antibiotics were given should be known as you may need to add a prophylactic antibiotic prior to the drainage procedure, just because that you may risk into rupturing those abscesses and causing other, other sepsis. So most common organisms, when we start with the plural infections, like the abscesses in the, in the chest, include the streptococcus, the staphylococcus, uh, E. coli, proteus, enterobacti, and pseudomonas. So the British Thoracic Society has recommended that for these patients can, can use penicillin, example like amoxicillin, or penicillin combined with the beta-lactamase inhibitors like coamoxiclav or piperacillin tazobactam, and also some of people use cephalosporins. So for liver, again, the most common organisms as shown here, you can read about it, but mostly are almost the same as the other ones. So the recommended antibiotics for these include the third generation cephalosporins. You can give it plus or minus metronidazole, or you can give the cabapenem group, which includes the meronem group, or you can give penicillin with beta-lactamase inhibitors, or you can give fluoroquinolones, but all these should be combined with metronidazole IV. So any infection in the abdomen, again, the organisms are almost similar to what we saw in the liver with the addition of maybe candida species. So the regime includes the combination of amoxiclav, or you can give Cipro with metronidazole. But for patients who are critically ill, you should consider using piperacillin or tigacycline uh, or echinocandine. So, but all these recommendations, as I say, they are only given not as uh, a prophylactic treatment. These patients should already be on these medications prior to the procedure. So you give them until you get the results for culture, then you compare your uh, antibiotics you're using with the culture results that you get. So for biopsy, the use of anti uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for biopsy has not really been shown to show any benef beneficial uh, outcomes. So except for when one has to perform a transrectal ultrasound guided prostate biopsy. So for these patients, the organisms that were seen isolated either in urine or blood culture show to be E. coli most commonly. So the regime in here includes the oral ciprofloxacin, or you, you can give fluoroquinolones, and or you can give first or second or third generation cephalosporins. So now we move to vascular procedures, uh, starting with angiography and angioplasty. So the incidence of bacteremia post-procedure in this have been shown to be ranging from four to 8%, with most of the uh, organisms being a skin flora. So most reasons that have been shown to be uh, the cause of the contamination or the causes of sepsis includes the contamination of the catheters prior to procedure. Either a patient has repeated puncture of the vessel or repeated catheterization of the indwelling sheath. So prophylaxis is, has been deemed unnecessary except for when required in those high-risk group categories, advanced age, diabetes, or immunocompromised patients. And most uh, of the focus has been shown to be on the care of the, of the place, like aseptic techniques should be used when you're performing the intervention procedure. So when you're doing, uh, when you're placing a bare metal stance, 
So infections to this though they're rare, but have been found to be very serious and have been related to stent thrombosis, septic embolization, pseudoaneurysm formation, and hemorrhage. So most of these uh, organisms that have been uh, cultured have been shown to be uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So the prophylaxis again for these <clears throat> have been advanced, uh, have been advised to be used in patients with immune deficiencies, such as those patients with advanced age, chronic renal disease, diabetes mellitus, and immunosuppressive medication, or when you have a difficult procedure such that you have to use multiple guide wire exchanges, a procedure takes a long time, or you have an access site hematoma, or in a, in a situation where you have to do a stent of an area which is often punctured, like in patients with hemodialysis access, or in those patients with uh, surgically difficult areas to, to reach. So in these patients, you should consider using this regime as, as have been uh, put forward. So again, when you have a vascular stent grafts, so uh, in most places, uh, prophylactic antibiotic uh, in these procedures have been deemed routine. So despite that the rate of infection being very low, like less than one, but the mortality rate has been shown to be very high. So that's why most places consider this as a routine. So sources of infection in these procedures would be intraoperative contamination of the graft, secondary infection from seeding, or a secondary formation, uh, secondary to formation of an autoenteric fistula. So these are the sources of infection. So most common organisms found in these include, as we see here, projected, and the regime would include uh, one gram of IV cefazolin, or you can use vancomycin or clindamycin in those patients with penicillin allergy. So again, we move to closure devices. So most infection results into either you get a groin cellulitis or a femoral arteritis. And the most common organism, again, related to skin flora, which includes the SRS and S epidemis. So the prophylaxis in these closure devices are only considered in the high risk uh, category of patients. And the regime has been shown to be one to two grams of cefazolin would suffice. So TIPS procedure. So infection following the TIPS procedure has been recorded uh, to be around 20%. And of these patients that get stent lumen uh, infection being around 1.3%. So the most common encountered organism post TIPS include the Staph aureus, again, Enterococcus E. coli, Klebsiella, and Streptococcus bevis, and the Candida albicans. So the prophylaxis for these uh, should include the third generation cephalosporins, such as uh, ceftriaxone. You can either give one gram or two grams. And some people had, uh, have advocated for the use of IV combination of ampicillin with salbactam. So again, consider that in these patients that have to undergo TIPS, any patient that has to undergo TIPS with central venous catheters, those catheters should come out prior to the procedure, as these can be also the sources of infection. So uterine artery embolization, this has been now like generally accepted treatment for symptomatic fibroids, but most common uh, infection after the embolization is related to the infected fibroids. So the risk of infection uh, is, ranges from 0.2 to 2%. And the most common organism found, again, same Staphylococcus aureus or species and Streptococcus species. So prophylactic antibiotic has been regarded as a routine also for these procedures and would include a combination of metronidazole with cephalosporin, equinolone such as ciprofloxacin, gentamicin, or amoxicillin. So trans arterial chemoembolization, most common uh, complication reported in this include the abscess formation, which these mostly generate from the necrotic tissue post-embolization. So the regime here aims to cover all those enteric organisms and includes ceftriaxone, uh, a combination of sublactam and ampicillin, or you can give cefazolin with metronidazole prior to procedure, but also should be followed with coamoxiclav, which is given for five days after discharge. 
So for the central venous axis, most common uh, source of bacteremia is associated with the central venous catheters with an incidence which ranges from 0.6 to 6.5 episodes in every 1,000 catheters that are placed. So the risk factors uh, for these include really the type of catheter, which either is a uh, temporary catheter or a tunnel catheter, uh, skill of the operator also, whether a person is well-skilled or a new person to place in the catheter, type of the barrier precautions used, hematological diseases and immunosuppressed patients, like those patients with uh, high-dose chemotherapy and those patients dependent on parenteral nutrition. So most common organisms, again, found with these include the Staphylococcus epidermis, which are the most common ones, which are followed by Staphylococcus aureus and Candida species. So the routine antibiotics for these have not really been recommended, but it sh they should be considered in patients with high risk uh, category, which includes the immunocompromised patients. So placement of IVC filter uh, infection following this is uh, really rare. So antibiotic prophylaxis has not really been required with this, but reinforcement should be made on the good aseptic techniques during placement of the filter. So in conclusion now, so knowledge of the likely procedure specific pathogen is necessary when establishing antibiotic prophylaxis regime. And uh, if, uh, even after 25 years, because this was the first article that was reviewed after 25 years of the other articles that came out. So there's still insufficient evidence on the prophylactic use of uh, in interventional procedures, which has resulted into a wide variation in practice. So different people use different antibiotics or different, either they use prophylaxis or they don't use prophylaxis. So this paper has presented evidence from different observational studies, case series, and surgical literature. And it only aims to guide users, but it shouldn't be used as a set of rules or the standards. So more studies are required for, for this, for to consider antibiotic prophylaxis. So things that you need to consider it's that first, when necessary, prophylaxis should be given prior to the procedure and not after the procedure because it, then it wouldn't be covering anything. And whenever possible, single agent with narrow spectrum of activity should be used to avoid emergence of antibacterial resistance. And third is that account of patient's clinical circumstances should be taken into consideration, whether the high-risk group or the non-risk patients. So choice of an agent also may differ between hospitals and will depend on the local factors, like such as availability of those medications, and also will depend on the resistant organism and frequent review by microbiology department. So they always advise that it should be in correlation with the microbiology department that will give you the, the specific organism that is cultured from those samples. And lastly, is that maximum sterile precautions should always be considered because this will reduce by a very large percentage the risks of infection post procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the welcome, Prof. Mari. Yes, yes uh, thank you. So, uh, as of that was uh, an, an excellent run through of a complicated, if I may say, uh, potentially boring topic, but uh, it, it is important to, to think about these things. So, what we do in our practice is we've, we've come to uh, an agreement in our practice and we. We, Hi, we can't hear you. Well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no, yes, no. I'm kind of cutting off. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you, Azza. That was an excellent presentation for a very complicated uh, topic, something that's, that's really important as, as I think you made clear during, during your talk. 
So, you know, just a couple of, of comments. So what we do at our place is we've come to an agreement on what we do. And actually what we've done is just uh, laminated the most recent SIR guidelines and we leave those uh, in our angio room and we refer to those regularly whenever there is a case to be sure that we're, we're following the guidelines and we know specifically what medications are, are appropriate. You know, as you say, you know, there, there's so much complexity to all of this and, you know, the whole issue of, of bacterial resistance, you know, if, if you, I'll say, follow those guidelines and give antibiotic prophylaxis to virtually every single one of our patients, it adds a lot of cost. It adds a lot of time because, you know, maybe they show up in your hallway or your room and then you realize you need to give them antibiotics. Now you're going to need to wait to get the, uh, the antibiotic and need to infuse it. And so you could add an hour to your procedure by doing that. So, you know, there, there's a number of practical aspects. Uh, the other thing, as you said, is the importance of, of technique. And, and one important thing in, in terms of, you know, for example, nephrostomies and biliary drainages is that you can easily make people septic by over distending the system. So technique is important. So what I do is, you know, when you get into a, a distended biliary tree or, or renal collecting system, you know, puff in a bit of contrast, confirm you're in the right place, and then aspirate some of the fluid and, and send that immediately for culture, and then replace the volume of material that you've aspirated with your contrast. But if you just go in and you take a, a markedly distended system and add 5, 10, 15, 25 cc's of, of contrast, you are then going to push so to speak, those infected, that infected material uh, into the vascular system and, and cause sepsis. So, you know, a very simple technique to, to reduce the incidence of sepsis. It's also important to remember that the, the use of antibiotics, and again, particularly in, in bilaries and nephrostomies, uh, although may reduce the risk of sepsis, so to speak, it doesn't stop people from getting symptomatically ill and there's this uh, from, from circulating toxin that's, that's already in, in, the, in the, the fluid. And so it's not uncommon to uh, have the patient experience severe rigors about 30 minutes after you've started the procedure, which is, I'm not sure if you've ever seen it, it's, it's a really very scary thing to watch and it's obviously a very scary thing for the patient to experience. And so, you know, knowing that that may occur, I always warn the patient that this may happen. And uh, again, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this or know what, what the treatment is. What would, you, what would you do if you saw a, a patient experiencing severe rigors half an hour after you started a biliary drainage? Any takers on that? Yeah, so for us, basically, we give um, like IV paracetamol and because we already have given by then uh, the antibiotics. So we give um, paracetamol. That's what we use. And then the fluids also. Dantrolene. Right. Go ahead. So Dantrolene is the answer. Yes. Um, so actually we use, or the, the thing to use, I'm not sure why this works, is Demerol. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I think so we don't have that. We don't have in Tanzania Demerol. So we use uh, paracetamol. Okay, well, paracetamol is acetaminophen, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so that's different than, than Demerol. So again, Demerol, for whatever reason, seems to be the thing that, that reduces that, the, the symptoms from that. Because again, it's, it's not sepsis as such, it's not bacteremia, it's, it's circulating toxin. So yeah. you know, you're not gonna treat that with antibiotics. Yeah. Anyways, I just raised that as a, an interesting uh, issue that occurs. Um, another thing, again, in terms of technique is, you know, for patients 
requiring IVC filters, you know, we find many of them are, are, are ill, uh, have been in the ICU and have a central line in it. So uh, I'm a pretty lazy guy. So if someone comes down from the ICU with a right IJ line who needs an IVC filter, I would be tempted just to go ahead and then exchange that out over a guide wire and then place the IVC filter. Do you have any comments or thoughts about that? Doesn't it have to depend on uh, how long the temporary catheter was there for? Exactly. Very good. So I'm, I'm not sure I exactly remember the day, the number, but let's say if it's less than three days, then a guide wire exchange is appropriate. But if it's been longer than that, you should then remove that line and obtain new venous access. There was actually an article uh, many years ago now from, from one of my buddies in Canada who reported a death from uh, placing an IVC filter in someone who, uh, who had a long-term central line in place. So something to think about. Mm. Um, a couple of other things. So abscesses, so that's an interesting thing. So you're right. So most of the patients that come to us with abscesses uh, are, are, are already on antibiotics. Uh, which is good, but there are times when our IED guys have specifically said, please don't give prophylactic or pre-procedure antibiotics because we don't want to take a chance at, at for example, contaminating the aspirate you're going to get because that will change their ability to actually culture something. When someone's been on antibiotics for you know, a period of time and you send a, an aspirate for culture, it, it often will be negative or, or not really reflect what the true initial uh, etiology of the infection was. So that's, that's something to think about. Um, but again, most of the people I find that with abscesses come down on, on antibiotics already. So on the same topic, there's a question that has been asked, like how long do you keep uh, patients on antibiotic after culture results? Like, does it depend on the type of an abscess or basically like, do you give four weeks to all patients with uh, abscesses post, post procedure that is? Well, so that raises many interesting questions is who's in charge of the patient? Now, I'm, I'm not sure if things work differently there, but, but for us, as, as much as we are involved to some degree clinically, you know, when we drain an abscess, they are discharged from us to their surgeon, their gastroenterologist, their hospitalist, their family doctor who is in charge of maintaining the antibiotic uh, treatment. Uh, but I would say typically for a, a basic abscess, we would uh, probably just leave them on antibiotics for two weeks, you know, see how they are, you know, is, is the drainage decreased? Is their symptoms decreased? Is their white blood cell decreased? And, and really use those things as guidance. Okay. And there's a question for tips because what was recommended was that uh, most people give antibiotics um, pre-tips procedure. Do you consider it as a, say, as something that would be uh, recommended, like a must to do uh, antibiotics? Because from the article, it says that in patients with high risk and most patients that come in for tips are basically like those high risk patients and they can't really tolerate uh, having infections. So most people would consider giving antibiotics, but is that something also you consider as a must? Well, so I haven't reviewed the literature, so I, I actually don't do tips, so I, I can't answer that. You guys just okay. recently did a tips there. Did, what did you do about the antibiotics? Did you give any? We did give some, yeah. Yeah, pre, I, I pre would think as, as a general rule, antibiotics would probably be administered, but I'd have to review the literature. As I say, I, in, our, in our practice here, we don't do them. Okay. Um, you made, I think you made a comment with central lines and I yes. don't remember exactly what you said, but we don't, yeah. we don't give antibiotics for any central line. Yes. We used to for, you know, the compromise slash chemotherapy patients. Yeah. But, you know, then, you know, the literature, as you say, kind of comes and goes and changes. So for years we did, and, and then we stopped, you know, if you add up, 
you know, if you look at kind of the risk benefit ratios and how many infections you're going to save versus how much money you're going to uh, spend, and actually there's, there's more, potentially more risk of having an allergic reaction to antibiotics than there is from having an infection from not giving antibiotics. So I say we, we here don't give antibiotic prophylaxis for any central line, chemo, immunocompromised, uh, or, or TPN or any of those things. Yeah, so even this paper said that the agreed uh, comments were that it's not necessary unless you really need it. So I guess like those patients that already show signs of infection before you place in the central line. Yes, of but, course. So that's then, then that's not prophylaxis, then that's really yeah. treatment. So empirical. Exactly. So here, Janice just popped up in, in chat. Thank you so much about tips. And so uh, she did indicate that uh, current guidelines are a ceftriaxone for, for TIPS patients. Okay, so one gram ceftriaxone. Thank you. Then, so there's uh, another question about the biopsy. Um, so they're asking about the trans... Uh, rectal. Uh, ultrasound-guided prostate biopsy. So the recommendations were that because these patients mostly get uh, infections from the biopsies, so they would recommend uh, for prophylactic antibiotics. But post, again, I think it's the same as what Mari was commenting before, like after you finish the biopsy, basically the patient goes back to their caring physician. So it really depends with what the physician thinks, but I think probably a five day should cover. So we've uh, we stopped doing prostate biopsies at our center in North America. Predominantly, it seems to be taken over by the urologist. But in the old days when I did them, we would give, uh, we would use, CIP, uh, no, SEPTRA. Uh, we would give, you know, a dose immediately prior to the procedure, 30 minutes prior to the procedure, and then give them one or two days uh, following the procedure. So a, a very short course to prevent the, the potential infection related to the procedure. Yeah. So if everyone has the app, this current app that was put out by SIR this year, uh, I'll try to see if I can put the thing in there for prostate biopsy. It recommends the same one gram of ceftriaxone plus 1.5 gram per kilogram of gentamicin. That is the, there is no consensus for other deep tissue biopsies except prostate. So it says yeah. recommended no antibiotics except for transrectal prostate, and it actually gives exactly how much it is. And that also you can give 500 milligrams of Cipro plus gentamicin. Do you have a link to that app? Yes, or I'm gonna see if I can, um, I can send it in. There was a lot of hype about it in Twitter and I just downloaded it from the Twitter page, <laughs> but I will see if I can put the link in the chat. And, and is this a phone app that someone can have on Androids or Apple phones? I don't know about Androids. I have it on my Apple phone. It says just SIR guidelines and it has all the antibiotics as well as all of the, um, as well as uh, the uh, bleeding risk and what to do. Wow. And, and it's being updated, uh, you know, just on your on your phone, if things change, you'll just be able to get the newest version. So it tells you what to do with, um, you know, DOAX, antiplatelets, you know, when to stop it, how long to wait, if you need to check labs or not, on almost every procedure that we do. That's a nice app. All right, I'll try to put it in the chat right now. Thank you. I don't know if... So for deep seated uh, uh, biopsies, so there is no, uh, because uh, one question was for deep abdominal, chest, neck, biopsy, mass biopsy, do you recommend prophylactic antibiotics, even if you say that the benefit is, of it is controversial? So we, we don't use prophylactic antibiotics for those circumstances that you just mentioned. Okay. Um, a couple of other interesting things that uh, 
as it brought up. So she mentioned strep bovis. This is kind of an interesting little uh, tidbit that I learned many years ago. Do, does strep bovis mean anything to anyone? Yes, is this from animals, from cows? Like from the cow? Well, I'm, I, I guess it's obviously re related to the cow based on its name, but uh, in terms of it, if your patient blood culture is positive or strep bovis, you can infer that they have a diagnosis. What is that? What disease do they have? Endocarditis. Is it, is it, Colon, is it cancer. Colon cancer. Oh. There, there's a very high, and I'm not sure why, there's a very high association with strep bovis and colon cancer. So if someone, any of your patients have strep bovis, uh, bacteremia, you need to uh, do a colonoscopy or evaluate their colons. Oh. Um, one interesting, other interesting thing that's come up. So Cipro, I love Cipro. It's just such an easy drug to use. It, 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 it's used uh, for treatment and prophylaxis in, in so many uh, arenas. But more and more recently, they're coming out with uh, statements and concerns regarding that entire class of drugs effect on, on uh, I can't think of what word to use, on, on cellular material. So it's been linked to risk of Achilles tendon ruptures. And just recently I read an article, I'll see if I can try and find it. There is, uh, it's essentially contraindicated in anyone with aortic aneurysms, previous dissections, Marfan's disease, and things like that because of it's uh, it, it may predispose or or make their disease worse cause aortic rupture or or something like that so something to think about and i think as time goes on that that whole class of drug is probably going to fall out of favor but it's so ingrained in our everyday practice and as i say it's so easy to use but just uh keep that in the back of your mind and i'll, I'll see if i can find that article Uh, I think those are pretty much all the complications, all the, uh, the comments that I had on Aza's excellent talk. Again, you know, this is an important topic and I recommend you all, you know, pay close attention to it. And as Aza mentioned, you know, these, these are guidelines, they're not rules and, and as individuals and, and as practices, you need to figure out what, uh, what works best uh, for you, but you know, always, always think about these things and, and try and err a bit on the side of caution, but on the other side, not everyone undergoing every procedure needs antibiotic prophylaxis. Thank you, Janice, for posting that, uh, that uh, link to the SIR yeah, actually, I sent it in the WhatsApp chat. I wasn't, I, I don't know, I was having a brain attack and put the wrong link in this chat. So it's in the WhatsApp chat for uh, training, the actual link to the app. So maybe since you have more effect on the SIR than uh, others in this conversation, not all of us have uh, Apple devices. It'd be really great to have this app available on the Android. I believe that that is in development already. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, is there any other question? Someone, anyone to ask? I hope that uh, we, uh, oh, Azza, do you have any other addition? Nope. Thanks everyone for tuning in and for the comments. Okay. Thank you all. Now, maybe uh, this is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for tuning in.